evening and welcome to the halfway stage in our series with Ian and Paul neck and neck and Ian reckoning he has an excellent chance of snatching victory in the second half, much as Chelsea did at Wembley last week. <laughs> in the news this week, after a man develops a car that runs on fertiliser, one or two side effects emerge. <laughs> In an effort to beat slot machine fraud on the London Underground, Kenneth Clark unveils the new-look pound coin. <laughs> and after Spider-Man is dropped by ITV, he has difficulty adapting to a normal job. <laughs> on Ian Hislop's team, a comedian who apparently always keeps a piece of paper and a pen next to the bath in case he gets inspiration. So tonight he's naturally asked for a loofah and a bottle of shower gel. Hugh Dennis. And on Paul Merton's team, a former police chief, now a farmer with over 40 pigs. <laughs> <laughs> I say no more. John Stalker. <laughs> so, with all the hesitant shyness of Elizabeth Hurley, let's shimmy into round one. Two uh, flimsy bits of film held together with safety pins. Ian and Hugh, what's this old thing? Ah, Gary Bushel. <laughs> <laughs> Bones. Well spotted. Is this uh, Europe's... Um, oldest man found near Eastbourne, West Sussex. <laughs> Naturally. <laughs> there are still people living in Eastbourne who are older than that. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, it's, uh, it's the oldest man in Europe, found in a quarry near Chichester. According to the Daily Mail, he was called Fred. Uh, according to the Telegraph, he was called Roger. Presumably, if he'd been reported in the Financial Times, he'd been called Quentin. <laughs> He was the first known European and possessed a considerably smaller brain than the average European of today. But scientists say that even he would have been able to tell that the ERM was a hopeless idea. <laughs> uh, Paul and John, what's all this then? How to shoot somebody sitting on your wing mirror. <laughs> <laughs> uh, drop that gun or I'll show you me underwear. <laughs> oh, that's right. There's a, yeah. there's, there's a heart in there somewhere. Yeah. If it can stop a fist, it can sure stop a bullet. <laughs> <laughs> It's all the spaghetti, then. Ah. Well, I was rather hoping you could tell me. Yeah, I think that it's uh, an American invention that yet hasn't reached here, which is... Uh, spaghetti. The, um, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> a fleeing criminal is sprayed with glue. So he, he sort of freezes him in time and he makes him easier to shoot. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of a glue-to-kill policy. That's right. <laughs> 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 well, you sort of got the American side of the story. What's the British oh, well, side Well, it's of it? the new... It, it, the, the police are being armed under special circumstances now, aren't they? When mm. they're being shot at. <laughs> Somebody comes up, punches you in the stomach, get the gun out of the car. Mm. <laughs> but they're hidden, apparently. They're hidden in a special place in these... Yeah, but they know where they are, so it's all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is it the glove compartment they hide it? No, it's, it's the, the back the of the... There's a little compartment in the back of the car. Oh, really? Under one of the seats. That. Is that true, John? No. <laughs> <laughs> None of it's true. From It is at the moment. From next week, they'll be hanging from a belt at the side of them. The Who answer, will? The, 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 the bullets. <laughs> uh, it is the news that we will now see uh, armed policemen on the streets of mainland Britain. Uh, the intention is that this will reduce the amount of gun-related crime like it has in, say, America. <laughs> As you saw at the end of that film, American police have unveiled a gun that fires a special foam at criminals which glues their feet to the floor uh, while they try to run away. It's been developed by one of America's leading research laboratories in conjunction with experts from the Beano. <laughs> uh, Ian and Hugh, who and where? That's Britain's oldest man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a public hospital. Mm. Charles hasn't seen one of those before. That's Ooh. a bird. That's a bridge, I think, isn't it? Yeah. That's it is. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> I'm fairly sharp. That's a duck, too. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, it is a bridge, but uh, what's it got to do with the story? Well, I reckon it's in Regent's Park, isn't it? <laughs> Might be. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's where Diana rescued a drowning man. <laughs> or helped a tramp from a pond, depending on who. <laughs> <laughs> he was soaking wet, and she pulled him from the pond and said... Uh, Oh, this is terrible. You must be wet through. But come with me. I've got £160,000 of clothes you can change into. <laughs> and what was the other part of the story? Well, that's the usual other part of the story. It's the Battle of the PR. Mm. Prince Charles decides, oh, I'll go to St Petersburg and do some worthy British trade exports. That'll get me in the news. Next morning, his wife, hero, saves dying man. <laughs> yeah. He went there to look at Littlewoods, didn't he? 
I don't know why he bothers. There's, there's a... one in Oxford Street. Yeah. <laughs> but apparently there's a terrible shortage of acrylic stay pressed slacks in my shop. <laughs> It is. Uh, it's Charles and Diana vying for the headlines again. Prince Charles uh, was on his historic trip to Russia, which has been described as a dry run for other royal visits. So Princess Margaret obviously not going then. <laughs> <laughs> Back in England, the uh, Princess of Wales uh, claims to have saved a drowning man conveniently enough the very day after she was attacked for spending a huge amount of Charles' money. Uh, Diana spends 4000 a year going to the gym and £2,500 to have her bowels cleaned out by colonic irrigation. Thank goodness it was only the bloke in the gym who set up the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Paul and John, another crooked tale for you. Double yellow lines, I recognise those. <laughs> yes, this is the, um, uh, the thieves who stole a, a cash point machine and then installed it into a shop, an empty shop, and just left it there while people came in with their credit, their sort of bank cards and just sort of put their PIN numbers in and it sort of like got all the information of what their secret numbers were and then sort of started withdrawing money from their accounts on another day and they're doing so well now, they're opening up as a bank properly. <laughs> 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 the bank that likes to say thanks very much. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's true. Oh, it's the sting of the year. You're a bit of an admirer of those thieves. Yeah. Well, a good sting is, uh, is yeah. nice, nice to see. Not, yeah. uh, not, not, not too admiring, but... Uh, no. not. Yes. Nobody hurt. Bit of ingenuity. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is the gang who set up a fake hole-in-the-wall cash point in order to copy people's cards and then rob their bank accounts. Police have still not established the exact number of victims. They cannot put a definite figure on the total sum stolen and don't know if other bogus machines have been set up. But apart from that, they're absolutely bang on top of the case. <laughs> <laughs> Which uh, irregular transactions bring us bang to the end of round one and the misleading figures would appear to indicate that uh, both teams are on the level, Ian and Hugh and Paul and John sharing an even four. Before we experience the full scorching summer of round two, let's shiver a while in the Drizzly Bank holiday that is our caption competition. Ian and Hugh, here's yours. Uh, Paul and John, this is for you. <laughs> uh, so we step warily into round two, uh, territory as uncharted as Cliff Richard's bedroom. Uh, <laughs> one piece of sub-editorial whimsy per panellist. Paul, a tricky one for you to decipher. Personnel officers are a waste of time. Well, uh, personal officers are a waste of time. <laughs> you know, well, if, you, if you sort of send a personal officer down the shops to get you some fags or something, they'll come back with a lawnmower or something. <laughs> and they are a waste of time. You don't know the answer to this one, do you? <laughs> it's self-evident. Uh, not as such. Uh, it's, well, it's a good, I was going to say a good answer. It's actually exactly the same as the question, isn't it, really? Yeah. Um, <laughs> is there uh, a survey? Any idea over here? Well, it's is obviously it, a survey, uh, a study that's decided that personal officers are a waste of time. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know there, any other way of putting it, really. No, yeah. uh, no evidently. They because... are not um, as mm. good as they could be. <laughs> <laughs> they take a certain amount of time, but the bit of time they take <laughs> is wasted. <laughs> <laughs> Is this the one about the That's parrot really on amphetamines? <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, reading between the lines somewhat, isn't it? Um, it's a parrot on amphetamines, and the only thing it can say is personal officers are... <laughs> <laughs> but very quickly. And the neighbours are totally fed up with yeah. this boring parrot saying personal officers are a waste of time. Yeah. It's a huge court case. Mm, yeah. mm. It's not 100% true. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but then what is? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's getting rather philosophical now. Um, mm. Ian, any ideas as to what this might be? We reckon that the, the people in offices designated to deal with <laughs> uh, <laughs> the problems of their staff are, on the whole, not really working at 100% efficiency. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, yes. it's a very good phrase that would sum up what you've just said. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, it, is, uh, it is a new study by the LSE uh, which has revealed that uh, companies which employ personnel officers actually perform worse than those which don't. Or to put it another way, they're a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, apparently there are now so many personnel officers in Britain that they outnumber coal miners ten to one. If only you could convert power stations to run on bullshit. <laughs> Uh, ironically, You'd be in constant demand, wouldn't you? <laughs> yes. You've never always... been a personnel officer, have you? Uh, my brother has been. Mm. Oh. Well, he is actually. Really? Mm. Is he a waste of time? <laughs> <laughs> What's your brother's name? Bill. Yeah. Bill. Mm. <laughs> 
sorry, we have to be getting on. Um, <laughs> ironically, the government is now employing thousands of personnel managers oh, in hospitals. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> this, oh, we, were, we were right when we said it was a waste of time. <laughs> 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 have you got any pictures of him? <laughs> um, no, not on me. No, it's a suit you're looking at. Have you got any pictures yeah. of him? <laughs> no. Well, I, I think have this at is home. the most boring Obviously. round we've ever had on this. <laughs> <laughs> It's a waste of time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> would you have been Bill if you'd been the oldest? <laughs> or not? I probably would actually yeah, be, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. You're not actually called Hugh, are you, Hugh? No, I'm not called Hugh. <laughs> What's your real name? Pete. <laughs> Pete? I thought about Bill, but I didn't like it. <laughs> have you got a brother called Dennis? Dennis Dennis. Yeah. Because <laughs> Duran Duran had sort of the same thing. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> we still don't <laughs> know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, I think the answer is that personal <laughs> on yes. 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 time. Thank you. Uh, John, a spot of spontaneous translation required yes. here. Uh, we have ways of making you kip. This okay. is the hotel manager who was the equivalent of uh, Basil Fawlty, who wouldn't uh, allow his English guests to look out the window in case it wore the glass out or something. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't allow them to stay up after nine o'clock at night. And he was, not to put too fine a point on it, a bit, a bit like a Nazi. Uh, but he, he, you know, he, he's got a full hotel. Some people must like it. Uh, <laughs> not completely know. full. One of them escaped on a motorbike and is heading for the Swiss border. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, it is. It's all, uh, it's all about Austrian hotelier Irvin Wagner, was his name. Herr Wagner has now complained that the British press have stereotyped him as a World War II cliché. It wasn't his fault, he said, as he was bound by law to close the hotel bar at nine o'clock. He told reporters, I was only obeying last orders. <laughs> Hugh, um, oh, yes. more madcap antics for you. Crazy loophole must be closed. I think this is about mad people. Do you know why? It's the word crazy. <laughs> There's a loophole in the law, apparently, which says that if you are criminally insane and you escape, if you're on the loose for more than 28 days, they can't make you go back. So if you might go for 28 days without thinking that you are a cheese biscuit, <laughs> you'll be all right. You, you'll be allowed to go. Mind you, there is always that problem that if you are mad, you're probably not going to know how long you've escaped for. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's what it is. It is, yes. Thanks to this law, uh, one Stephen Newson, a six-foot-four crazed paranoid psychopath, is now a free man and could be anywhere in the country. And if he is anywhere in the London area, Ian and Paul both live in Battersea. So <laughs> um, does Angus some yeah. nights. <laughs> No, he was knocking off your missus as well. <laughs> not, uh, not yet, anyway. Um, <laughs> sends a love, by the way. Uh, uh, Ian, something of a crossword clue for you. Tom's will gives Toffs the jip. There's a man called Tom. He's a man who lived in a village, and his neighbours hated him, and they hated him right up until he died. And when he died, to get his own back, in his will, he gave all his garden, it was a couple of acres, I think, to New Age Travellers and Gypsies <laughs> 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 to camp on and have free festivals and drink special brew and have those horrid dogs on leaves that go out <laughs> <laughs> sniffing at things and <laughs> dig latrines in the fence. And... Anyway, they're furious, the neighbours, so there's nothing they can do about it. And a lot of people think it's quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it is uh, cantankerous farmer Tom Bailey. According to the Daily Express, Mr Bailey instructed lawyers to set up a camp on his 100-acre farm. There's one thing worse than a camp of gypsies, it would be a camp of lawyers. <laughs> uh, all of which willful behaviour leads us neatly to the end of our tabloid excursion. And the sordid truth is that Paul and John have got their noses behind with seven, while Ian and Hugh have got their tails in front with eight. Time now for the Chinese puzzle that is our odd one out round. Four choice dishes. Which one's the sweet and sour monkey brains? Paul. Uh, not, not quite as uh, simple as it seems, this one. Princess Margaret. Mm -hmm. Princess Margaret. That's Princess Alexandra. Margaret. And Patricia Kluge. Dunno. <laughs> Well, the top right is Marjorie Proops. It's got nothing to do with Princess Margaret. <laughs> Let's have a guess then. So, Princess What's Margaret with the glasses up the top on the right. Only one in black and white. And the one in black and white mm -hmm. is the odd one out. 
I don't think that's right. OK, go for it. She was a, um, a woman who Prince Philip um, uh, got to know very well. Um, in a... <laughs> <laughs> who, Princess Margaret? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He in married his sister, who's bound to meet her, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> there was a very stupid piece somewhere, I can't remember where. There's the Tatler, actually. It's quite a good article. Um, <laughs> suggesting that Prince Philip had had tea with, with a lot of women. Um, <laughs> over the uh, years. A euphemism um, I've not heard before. But, yeah. <laughs> yes. And not with his um, sister in law, obviously, because he wouldn't have done. No. He'd have had whiskey with her. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so I'll give you two points for that. Rumours abound that Prince Philip has, in fact, fathered an unwanted child who has threatened to embarrass him ever since. His name's Edward. <laughs> <laughs> John, uh, four rock and roll legends for you. Madonna, Mick Jagger, Chief Rayoni, <laughs> and Lynn Perry out of Coronation Street. It's to do with, um, with lip surgery. Lynn Perry's had it, has still got it and can't get rid of it. That's, what, <laughs> that's, why, that's why you've not seen it in Coronation Street for several months now. Um, the guy on the left, the, the Chief, whatever, he's, he's obviously... Uh, had it, uh, and, and I think Lynn Perry's probably jealous of it. Uh, Madonna has had all sorts of uplifts, but including the lips. Right. And the only, I think the odd one out is Mick Jagger, who looks as if he's had it and has never had it. Uh, his lips are like that because his mother used to stick him on shop windows when he was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's what I think. I think that uh, all but Mick Jagger have had artificial lip um, lifts. But, think, but yeah. Jagger hasn't. Yes, it's that all of them except Mick Jagger have had their lips artificially enlargened. Uh, Madonna. Enlargened? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not enlarged. No, no, no. <laughs> More so. No, these these with lips an have been in enlarged. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Madonna took 24 injections of cow hormones, uh, so she's not only got a lovely pair of lips, but she's now yielding 16 gallons a day. <laughs> uh, Is that her being milk, babe? <laughs> <laughs> Mick Jagger's lips, now 50, uh, have had an incredible life, singing countless number ones, kissing some of the most beautiful women in the world, and eating Mars bars in some rather unusual settings. <laughs> Phew. Um, four, four widely respected figures. Uh, the Queen. Hello. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Impersonation of Jesus, please. The yeah. Prince of Wales <laughs> and yeah. Ratu Sergis Siva, Lala Balavu, Vani Ali Ali Sukuna, Paramount Chief of Lao. <laughs> I'd love to yeah. see the size of his parking space. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if this is. Um... A very difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a feeling. I it wonder is. if it's got anything to do with being um, sons of God. Well, one of them certainly has something to do with that. <laughs> I'm not sure That's about the Jesus, other three. Right? <laughs> that is Jesus. Yes. Mm. Well, well done, Hugh. Um, um, <laughs> Prince. Um, Prince Gilly Gilly Ox thingy and of Katsuna yeah, yeah. of uh, Lao. He's probably son of God as well. Son of his father, who was probably In regarded as God on the island of Lao. That's almost certain. <laughs> uh, and Prince Charles um, is the son of the Duke of Edinburgh, isn't he? Mm, Supposedly. Yes. Uh, um, who is regarded as God, isn't he, in New Caledonia or somewhere like that. And, and the Queen, right. unfortunately, isn't, isn't the son of God. Well, partially because she's a woman and mm -hmm. partially because her father wasn't God. <laughs> It is a brilliantly deduced answer, uh, but nowhere near the right one. <laughs> um, the odd one out is Prince Charles is wearing a hat. Um, is that Jesus or is it Richard Branson? <laughs> I can't work on it. <laughs> well, I'm going to have to tell you. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually Prince Charles because all the others have... Prince Charles. Mm. Well, yes, but not the right reason, obviously. Well, yeah, I said Prince Charles, though. Well, because he had a hat on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You want me to give you a point um, for saying... Well, what well, sort of spurious answer yeah. are you going to come up with? <laughs> yes, all right, I'll give you one for Prince oh, Charles. Thank you. Um, it is Prince Charles because all the others have public holidays taken in honour of their birthday in Fiji. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jesus celebrated his birthday on Christmas Day, of course, which in those days was, in fact, in the middle of January, although that was just so that he wouldn't get his Christmas and birthday presents on the same day. <laughs> 
Uh, Ian, after uh, last week's choice of 13 candidates, your odd one out this week is reduced to a mere six. Uh, Ronnie Knight, Fred West, yeah. Birmingham Six Police Squad, <laughs> and Sir Nicholas Lyle, the Attorney General. This is about people who aren't going to be able to get a fair trial. That's and right. uh, Ronnie Knight, according to his lawyers, is not going to get a fair trial because there's been so much um, press about him, largely because he sold his story to the press. <laughs> um, the Attorney General, Nicholas Lyle, he got up in the House of Commons and said, Fred West can't get a fair trial because people have been writing about him in the press. Um, the Birmingham Six policemen, they actually got off the charges they were on. The trial started and then they said they can't get a fair trial because there's been all this press. Didn't stop the actual Birmingham Six going in. And then that's Nicholas Lyle himself, the Attorney General, who is the odd one out. He stops other people perverting the course of justice. But interestingly, in the Matrix Churchill case, he prepared three public immunity certificates trying to suppress evidence that would have got the men off. Which, in most people's terms, is um, perverting the course of justice. <laughs> so, I would say the only person there who really definitely should be inside is Sir Nicholas Lyle. <laughs> A perfect answer. It is uh, that all of them, except Sir Nicholas Lyle, have claimed through their lawyers that media coverage has made it impossible for them to have a fair trial. Uh, the trial of the Birmingham Six police was halted on this basis after they'd been accused of tampering with written evidence. In his summing up, the judge declared, uh, there are clearly many ramifications to this complex case, uh, but the police do a very difficult job, so I'm going to let you go. Hang on, this isn't my handwriting. <laughs> Uh, which litigious whinging brings us uh, innocently to the end of round three and the interim judgment pending the final round is that uh, Paul and John are on the defensive with ten while Ian and Hugh have a far from plaintiff thirteen. <laughs> Time now for our panellists to guess what's missing apart from their knowledge of the answers as they <laughs> struggle to work out which words have been randomly uh, secreted in the following headlines. This week's guest publication is the coffee table favourite, Electrical Review. <laughs> uh, those who uh, lag last leap first, so uh, Paul and John, here you go. Uh, gladiators rocked by what? Fall of Roman Empire. Uh. <laughs> Steroids are attack, isn't it? I mean, Roger Cook says you've been taking steroids, and they say, no, we haven't. <laughs> uh, yes, steroids claim is the right answer. Well done. Next, uh, church may be forced to sell what? Is it Turin Shroud duvet covers? I'm <laughs> 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 uh, sure it's only a matter of time, but no. <laughs> it's uh, church. Bishop Palaces. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, has the, the bishop's church, palaces? Bishop's yes, palaces. I'll give you. Yeah. Uh, I'll give you two for Christmas. You know yes. how Hugh knows grandest, that. How? His father's a bishop. Is that <laughs> true? Bill. Hugh? It is true. Well, we're not moving house. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm glad I brought up that your father's a bishop, and I know you are. I'm very pleased about that. <laughs> yeah. It's a big plus on the alternative yes. comedy circuit, it is. isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Alexi sells down to the Pope. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think uh, several hours ago you gave us the right answer, or nearly. It's, it's Grandest Palace was actually uh, what we were looking for. Auckland Castle, to be precise. Uh, next, Palestinian police move what? Busker. <laughs> <laughs> Into occupied territory. Uh, more precisely? West Bank. Mm, more precisely? Hebron. Uh, name Jericho. Of a city. Well done. Number yes, 27. Jericho. <laughs> yeah. Is, uh, Jericho. We got there in I the end. Like... And lastly, China slaps official health warning on what? Beards. <laughs> is Don't the bizarre silly. but correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, Ian and Hugh, you're on. What pose a hazard to health? Illnesses. Uh, again, no. is it probably pylons? absolutely right. Substations. Virginia Bottomley. <laughs> oh, yeah, no. Substations? Uh, it's uh, not really pylons or, or Virginia Bottomley. Um, pylons is the closest desk lamp, is actually what we were looking for. Uh, next, the porcupines point the way to what? Almost everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Cheaper um, electricity. 
Mm. Uh, I'll give you one for that. Efficient industrial heating. <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> uh, porcupines, as you knew, were a uh, brand name of Swedish storage heaters. Uh, next, what threatens rural calm? Cockerel with huge amplification system. <laughs> Heavily armed rural policemen firing Kalashnikovs <laughs> uh, from their bicycles. I think our imaginations are running away with us now. Uh, it's not quite that extreme. Leisure, leisure explosion is what we're after. And oh, finally, what dull. to be stepped up? Ladder. Ladders. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> who was first? Uh, it doesn't matter who was first because neither were right. Um, <laughs> the electrical industry. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, I it's... hate to see a man struggling. <laughs> yes. <laughs> unless it's Paul. <laughs> <laughs> and unless you're just about to win. Yeah. Uh, the answer is sheep scabs check. <laughs> <laughs> Which uh, myopic groping brings us to the end of this week's scrimmage and the uh, rather surprising news is that this week's Bombay Ducks are Paul and John with 17 and this week's Chicken Supremes are Ian and Hugh with 19. So a night out with Liz Hurley in that dress for our winners, a night out with Arthur Mullard in that dress. <laughs> Uh, okay. But before we hit the town, it's time for an unfortunate reminder of our caption competition. Ian and Hugh, what do you think of for this? Uh, escaped lunatic offers Tiger a cup of tea. <laughs> um, it's her saying, all I did was pour the Frosties down the sink. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Paul and John, this was yours. Yeah. Um, Noddy and Biggie's fine decapitated head in cupboard. <laughs> Puppet squad, yeah. nobody move. Noddy <laughs> <laughs> too big ears, that television set is too bloody big. <laughs> I said big ears, no more acid for me. <laughs> uh, on which uh, playful note, we say thank you to our panellists, Ian Hislop and Hugh Dennis, Paul Merton and John Stalker. And I leave you with news that the first meeting has been held of the Sellafield Skydiving Club. <laughs> uh, photographers get a sneak rear view of a new monument erected by the Mirror Group pensioners to Robert Maxwell. <laughs> <laughs> and after reading that injections of cow hormones can make your lips bigger and sexier, the Duke of Edinburgh gives it a try. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>